Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Again, in case you missed my introduction just a little bit ago, my name is Jason Maida, and I'm with American Pacific Mortgage, and uh, we're excited to bring this content to you tonight uh, for our Sac State alumni, and I think we probably have some other guests joining us just from the, the greater Sacramento market. Uh, we love getting a chance to put on these workshops. This is our opportunity to help educate our local communities in home ownership and what it can look like. You know, as we're <clears throat> getting to the end of 2022, this is a great opportunity to do some kind of financial planning, getting your kind of finances in order to set some goals for what's up to come in 2023. So I think for those of you that are joining tonight's class, it's a really great opportunity to get a chance to kind of learn a little bit more about what home buying can look like for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our class is going to run about 60 minutes, so we should have you wrapped up uh, right around seven o'clock. And we do encourage questions. So if you can just use the Q&A uh, function on Zoom, and I'll get a chance to answer those questions as we roll through tonight's content. Uh, Ken Fleck, who's uh, going to kind of help co facilitate some of this workshop with me. He'll also be helping with some of those questions. Uh, and all the material that we share with you uh, this evening, we're going to go ahead and send you out the deck page to tonight's presentation tomorrow. So we have all your emails on file. So we'll make sure that we share that content with you um, uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. And I know uh, for our Sac State alum, this is a big uh, week. Uh, in fact, what tomorrow, no, Saturday, we have our first playoff game uh, in the second round of the playoffs. So really excited to see what Sac State football is going to do. So uh, for those of you that are uh, here in the local Sacramento region, hopefully you're going to go out there and, and support the Hornets. Really super excited. I know we're going to be out there getting a chance to uh, support the, the crew as well. So um, again, really excited to bring this uh, information out to you today. Um, and this class is designed to help first time home buyers. So we actually teach this class every couple of weeks on Zoom. So if you do have some friends, family, maybe some coworkers that might enjoy some of the topics that you're going to learn tonight, feel free to have them check out mortgageeducate.com. It has a list of our all of our upcoming schedules. We'll be posting our January, basically our Q1 schedule here in the next couple of weeks. So just a quick a little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Jason, and I'm the branch manager here with American Pacific Mortgage. We are based out of Sacramento. In fact, we're on J and 9th Street in downtown Sacramento. Uh, that's kind of our home base, but we get a chance to serve our clients all over the greater, greater California markets. Uh, we also do multiple states. We are a nationwide lender. We're a direct direct lender. And so, um, you know, we do have a full wide array of products, which you're going to learn a little bit about tonight. Um, here's tonight's talking points. Uh, we're going to talk about the housing market. So a lot going on there. Uh, we're going to kind of dive into interest rates and what's going on with interest rates right now. Finally, some positive news with interest rates. Uh, we're going to talk about does buying make sense? Um, buying is probably going to be one of the largest investments you make in your financial future. So making sure that we're totally prepared and have all the right tools and resources available is super important. So that's, of course, why many of you are here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about credit and, you know, what credit uh, you know looks like and some different ideas around kind of improving credit. We'll look at student loans, different types of loan programs that are available to you, the asset requirements that you need in purchasing a home. So what do we need to save? Um, we're going to look at different down payment assistance programs uh, in partnership with Cal HFA, which is the California Housing Finance Agency. I'm going to share with you some of the products that are available now and some stuff that we can look forward to in the next couple months. And then we'll wrap up tonight's discussion looking at the process of buying the house. So what does it look like if I'm going to complete an application, get pre-approved, and then how do I get all the way to you know, getting the keys to my house? So we're going to talk about that tonight. And then what a consultation looks like. That's one of the kind of consultations we do to help kind of design a home buying plan for you and hopefully get you pre-approved. So those are tonight's discussion points tonight, uh, tonight's discussion points. And so we'll get a chance to kind of elaborate on some more of those topics as we roll through tonight's presentation. So let's first of all talk about does buying make sense? Because, you know, for some of our uh, future home buyers, you know, this may be kind of a, a longer term goal. Others, it might be a near term goal. Um, you know, I had a uh, the clients that I met with this evening right before tonight's class and they're ready to buy right now because they see the opportunity in the market. And I think everybody's on a little bit of a different timeline, but nonetheless, there's still some incredible benefits that come with owning a home. Um, you can create stability in your housing payment so you don't have to worry about like your landlord increasing the rents on you. Uh, this is an asset, so you have the ability to be able to pass along the asset to the heirs of your estate. Um, you know, there's growth of equity that comes with owning a home. So when you look at home appreciation, Whatever you buy the house for, so let's say I buy a house for three hundred thousand and it grows to four hundred thousand in value, that hundred thousand dollar increase is called appreciation. And there also is still some tax benefits that come with owning a home: the potential tax deductibility of interest, um, and that will change for everybody's uh, each each client's tax situation. But there's still some incredible benefits that come with owning a home, and 
as we're kind of preparing to buy, I think a great place to kind of launch in tonight's discussion is going to be around budgeting and figuring out, you know, what it looks like for me if I continue to rent and I stay on that pace, or if I decide to purchase a home, what that is going to look like for me. So I'm going to walk our, our group through a rent versus buying calculator right now, just so we can kind of do a quick assessment of comparing the two paths of renting versus buying and what that could look like for me. Um, so this calculator is brought to us by Freddie Mac and um, it's the link is embedded in the presentation here. So when you get the deck page tomorrow and you want to kind of do your own calculation, you can absolutely do that. I'm just going to take you through a what if scenario based upon, you know, kind of some examples that we see with clients here locally in the Sacramento market. So the first tab is going to be around renting. And so we're going to plug in for a monthly rent. We'll just say $2,500 a month in rent. Um, and then we have renter's insurance when we rent. So many of you that are currently renting a place, you, you probably are paying renter's insurance. So we'll put that at $15 a month. Um, rental increase. So let's say our rent goes up 3% every year uh, or, um, as we kind of renew our lease or whatnot. And then look, looking at buying a house, I'm going to put a purchase price of $525. Now, I know that varies for everyone, um, and depending on you know where you're where you're purchasing. Um, I am in, could, you probably could argue that maybe we could go with today's prices, maybe get down closer to the $450 level. Um, and so that'll obviously change the savings that we have of buying versus renting because your, your monthly mortgage payment is going to decrease a bit. Um, the minimum down payment, which you'll learn a little bit more around product later on, it, the minimum down payment is 3% as a first-time home buyer. And then we'll have property taxes when we purchase a home. Generally, we're going to calculate taxes at 1.25% of the sales price, but that does vary based upon where you buy, the type of property you buy. So if I buy a new construction home, those property taxes could look a little bit higher. Um, then we have homeowner's insurance that's going to cover your home for fire, vandalism. Um, you know, In some cases, you may need to carry flood insurance, like some of our areas in the Thomas area require flood insurance. Um, and then there's maintenance on your home. So we want to factor that into the budget as well, too. And then we have loan information. Um, and you know, generally for our first time home buyers, we're going to elect a 30 year fixed mortgage. So that means the payment is fixed for a full 30 year period of time. And then we have interest rates and interest rates have gone down a little bit. Um, it's funny, I was teaching this class four weeks ago and we were talking about rates in the 7% range and now we're backed into the 6% range. So that's super important when it comes to affordability. So, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to plug in 6.1 here. Hopefully, knock on wood, we'll see rates continue to slide a little bit um, to improve that affordability that much more. Um, we have origination charges, and those are what costs a lender is going to have in a transaction. When we think about home buying, there's kind of two major kind of savings categories. We're going to have to save up for down payment. We're also going to have to save up for closing costs. And so that origination charge is going to be in that, that closing cost bucket. And then discount points, and that's been pretty popular as of late because discount points allow a consumer to pay additional costs to bring down their interest rate. And we saw a lot more of that um, as interest rates, especially hit that 7% and beyond level. What a discount point does is if I pay 1% of my loan amount, let's say, for example, and I'm financing like $400,000. So 1% 1 of 400000 is $4,000. Generally speaking, if I increase my cost by 4000 it could potentially bring down my interest rate a quarter percent. So instead of a you know a six point one two five percent rate, maybe I'm getting a five point eight seven five percent rate. So those are ways to create savings. Now the trade off is there's increased costs, but the ability to be able to have a lower interest rate. The other settlement services are going to be like the additional closing costs around title and escrow, some of the local county charges for transferring the property, like transfer taxes recording charges. So we're going to lump those under uh, other settlement services. And then the other assumption we're going to make is around the appreciation of the home. Um, and that's kind of an un unknown, but we're going to kind of forecast out if, if I'm going to have 3% appreciation of my home over the course of my ownership. In this scenario, we're going to say a seven-year ownership. So I'm going to sell this home in 2029, basically. And then the selling cost of the home at 10% of the, the price of the home. Now, that could be a little bit less or more, depends. I, I, mean, I would always, almost argue that you could probably go to like 9% selling costs. Where that comes into play is that when I sell my home, I do have to pay the commissions to both the realtor that's selling my house, but also that represents the buyer. 
Good news for us as first time home buyers, you don't have to pay commissions for your agent that represents you. That's paid for by the seller. But you're also going to have other closing costs as it comes with a seller. Um, but I would say probably nine to 10 percent is probably a pretty fair range for selling costs. And then we'll have state and federal tax rate as well as the savings rate that we'll kind of plug in. So here's what this looks like when we put it, we kind of stack this up side by side. So over the course of seven years, what this analysis tells us, if, if I continue to rent um, versus buying, I have an opportunity to save about $66,000 over the course of seven years. Now, how is that factored? Well, if my rent continues to go up by about 3% every year when I renew my lease versus my mortgage payment, which is gonna be a bit higher, but I'm gonna have the opportunity of appreciation and tax savings over the course of that seven years, which gives me that $66,000 opportunity. When we think about our budget, you know, renting is $2,500 a month, as we know, the mortgage payment's gonna be more expensive because it's like 3,700. So you're going up $1,200 a month, but you have that opportunity to create an asset and the ability to save money over, over the seven years of, like we said, 66,000. Now, everybody's situation is a little bit different. I, I realize not everybody's spending you know, $2,500 a month in rent, it could be $500 to rent a room, or maybe you have a one bedroom studio, and that's $1,200 a month. So when we, when we do this analysis, and we compare it to owning, it just depends on, you know, what those numbers kind of stack up. But this is a great calculator for you to get a chance to kind of dive in yourself and take a look and see what what that um, scenario could look like for you. So that's the rent versus buying calculator. And again, we'll send this out in our presentation material to you tomorrow morning. Okay, so now we've kind of talked a little bit about our budget. Now let's take a, a look at what the market's doing. Um, and as you can imagine, the rapid rise in interest rates that we've seen in 2022 has really impacted home sales. And we've seen prices really start to come down from the highs that we saw earlier this year. So this is probably about second quarter of this year. And you can see with, with interest rates, and I'll show you an interest rate slide in just a bit, but as interest rates rose, Inventory started to stay on the market longer, so homes are not selling as quickly. Um, and you can see the 16% increase here going up, or days on market, I should say, went up 16 days year over year at this time. And then now we're starting to see prices start to come down. But we're, we're not seeing this big drop. And I think that's really important as first-time homebuyers. I don't think we're going to see this major like super correction, especially because interest rates are starting to bounce back a little bit. We've already been through the 7% range in interest rates. Now we're at 6%. So I, as you can see from this, this slide here, we're starting to see a little bit of leveling here in prices. So I think for some of us that may be waiting for like the big 20% drop, probably not going to happen, especially given what we're seeing with interest rates starting to level. Um, I think if we continue to stay on that pace where we're going 7 8% interest rates, we might have you know a pretty big correction. But it, at this point, it doesn't really look like it. Now, our prices lower than where some of our clients bought in 2021 and 2020, absolutely not significant. I mean, it has gone down a little bit, but I think still nonetheless, you know, real estate should be a long-term investment for us. If we're trying to just kind of, you know, just sell a pro or buy a property and sell it really quick to make money, that's probably not where this market is right now. There's not that kind of opportunity, but I think to create sustainable home ownership, there certainly is that opportunity in the marketplace. Um, so we had a question that came in. Can you show us a five-year look at kind of what the market looks like? Unfortunately, I don't have a, um, a snapshot of a full five-year on this slide, um, but we can certainly send that to you in a follow-up. So we'll definitely get that out. But um, you know, you, if you were to go just knowing the market here, um, you would probably see a steady, steady rise here. I mean, it was a swift move. Well, steady rise out this way, but swift move up, especially when we got to 2020. Um, I, I, I would have thought this would go up a little faster just because of what we saw with the changes in the pandemic. Obviously, you know, with the pandemic came lower interest rates, um, that rates touched down in the mid six, uh, mid twos, which obviously changed affordability, um, but there was a hyper competitive market. So we were seeing homes flying off the, off the shelf. We're seeing bidding wars on properties. And quite honestly, it was very difficult for first time buyers to get into the market. So we had several hundred buyers pre-approved, but they just unfortunately couldn't find their way in the market because they were being outbid by maybe uh, buyers that had more down payment, maybe some cash buyers. So it was a very hyper competitive market. Now, I think now when we look at today's market, there is a much more level competition. Yes, interest rates are you know two times higher than we've seen in the couple, past couple of years. 
but I think now we're starting to get to some normalcy with the market. <clears throat> now, interest rates can hopefully get down even further to create better affordability. But I think what we're seeing in the kind of the recalibration of the markets is, is, is a positive thing, especially for our first time buyers. So it's so refreshing to see first time buyers be able to go out in the market, have a reasonable negotiation with the seller and be able to get a home that you know, fits their, their overall budget needs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, interest rates has played a role in kind of the changes of the housing market, right? So here's kind of a snapshot of what interest rates look like. And this one goes back to 2018. So we got a little, long, little bit of a longer look here. Um, this gray bar here represents the start of the pandemic. And obviously, as you can see, interest rates follow with pretty, pretty big reduction. And so we, we basically bottomed out on the 30-year fixed right here. Actually, I thought we, yeah, probably right, right about there. Um, so, uh, late 2020, we saw the 2.6% rate and then we kind of bumped around a little bit. And then as we got into 2022, you know, we were seeing three and a half, 4%. All of a sudden we just started seeing a kind of a rocket take off with interest rates. And then eventually we crested the 7% rate, but now you see, we've kind of hit here. And now we've seen this, this drop down, this slide rep <clears throat> represents the mid sixes, but we're, we're in the, probably the low sixes right now, as I illustrated in my um, budget. Now, when we look at interest rates and where they're going now, what has led to interest rates is just kind of what we were experiencing as consumers in, in the market, which is inflation, right? Inflation, cost of goods is more expensive. So the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates um, over, the last, uh, over the last six months. <clears throat> but just recently, um, the consumer price index showed inflation rates not moving as fast as they, they once had expected. So there is talk that maybe these interest rate hikes will start to slow down. And if they do, um, that's obviously a positive sign for, for mortgage interest rates. And so kind of what we're seeing as of late is reaction to that consumer price index, kind of seeing what uh, that those reports have shown. And so we've seen some pretty big movements over the last couple of weeks, bringing interest rates down almost a full percent. So those are really encouraging signs in the marketplace. Now, the question is, where do we go with interest rates from here? Um, and that's kind of the unknown to see, are we going to finish off in the fives in 2023? Is it going to go to fours? Um, and, and that'll be something we'll have to kind of see, you know, what happens. I think ultimately, as an economy, if we do go down that recession path, you know, our, our sense is that, you know, that will lead probably more to per, get into the housing market, start seeing probably more of the, our wealthy, uh, you know, um, buyers in the market start to kind of go towards real estate. So that may make a, a more competitive real estate market for our first time buyers. So, you know, we're encouraging first time buyers to really understand your options and know that, you know, if you do want to get into the market and get pre-approved, now's a great time to get connected with us. So you can kind of know what your options look like um, because this market is a very fluid market, whether it's interest rates or price prices of homes. So it's great to know what, what that looks like for you. Now, when it comes to interest rates, interest rates aren't the same for all buyers. It does vary based upon credit score, the type of product you're going to elect, how much you plan on financing, uh, what your down payment is going to be. So if I put down 3% versus say 20%, that interest rate could look a little bit different for me. Um, and then as we talked a little bit about earlier, there's points or discount points that you can buy as a consumer to help bring down that interest rate. And then finally, term of your loan can change your interest rate. So the standard term usually is a 30-year fixed mortgage for a first-time buyer. But in some cases, buyers want to have a 15-year fixed mortgage, and that can help lower the cost of the overall interest rate. But it's really our kind of um, role in the process to help design a financing option that works best for you, given you know, what your budget looks like. Okay, any questions so far on, on some of the information I've shared? All right. Of course, go ahead and use the feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom, and then I'll, I'll be able to answer some of your questions on air. Um, as you saw in the interest rate slide, one of the characteristics that make up uh, the interest rate offering for a, a buyer is going to be credit. So it's really our job to help kind of educate you on what your credit looks like um, and areas of opportunity within your credit score. So because every loan product has a minimum credit score. So for an FHA loan, it's a minimum of 580. Conventional loans, a 620. For our VA loans, for our veterans that have served, it's 620. And then for the first time home buyer assistance programs, it's 640 minimum for an FHA loan, 660 uh, for low income buyers as a conventional loan, 680 
for our moderate income buyers um, on a conventional loan. So, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit. I want to kind of turn your attention to the FICO score calculation and just so you can kind of see how FICO score is made up. And 15% um, of the FICO score is going to be how long I've had credit. So the more mature my credit file is, potentially the higher my credit score is going to be. 20% is going to be how long I've had credit in use. More importantly, it's going to be inquiries that I'm trying to obtain for to access more credit. That can that can hurt our credit. And of course, if I'm opening new accounts, more new accounts that come online on my credit report also will impact my credit score. Now, in starting our process for a consultation, we do a soft inquiry, and that doesn't impact your credit score at all. Eventually, we'll need to do a hard inquiry once you have an accepted offer for a house, but generally, we'll start our process with a soft inquiry. So that gives us a good, good guideline of kind of what everything looks like from just a credit score perspective. Um, now, there's a credit rule in place with regards to hard inquiries for both auto financing and mortgage financing. So if you do elect to have a hard inquiry on a mortgage, for example, you do have a 30-day window of time to shop around with as many mortgage lenders as you want. So if I get my credit pulled today, today starts day one, I have 30 days from day one to be able to look at my options with other lending, lending institutions. 30% is going to be utilization or how much I owe on my revolving credit balances. So that's probably one of the biggest areas of opportunity for our first-time buyers. So the lower I can keep my credit balances versus my credit limits, the better my credit score is going to be. Um, here's a quick little tip just to help you with managing your credit card, something I, I do on a monthly basis, which is let's first of all look at our credit card statements. And when you look at your credit card statement, there's a billing cycle date and a due date. Well, the billing cycle date is the date at which the credit card issuer sends out the credit information to the three agencies, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Now, if you're in the habit of paying off your credit card or maybe making your payments on your due date, which is fantastic, um, that's, that's great. And that keeps you on time with your payments. But if you're really trying to lower your utilization, a tip would be is try to pay off or pay down your balance before the billing cycle date. So if my billing cycle date's on the 20th, Make sure that payment gets applied online, maybe on the 19th or 18th, because then you'll have a reduced balance. And then the balance that gets shared with the credit agencies will be at a lower amount. So then I have better utilization and hopefully have an improved credit score. So um, hopefully that's something that can help you in, in improving your credit score. Now, the next component to the FICO score calculation is payment history. And that's pretty self-explanatory, right? How I pay my bills, as long as I pay my bills on time, that's 35% of the waiting. Um, if you have any late payments or pay, past challenges with your credit, generally late payments are rated in 30-day lates, 60-day lates, and 90-plus 90 90 delinquency dates. So, um, you know, obviously we want to we want to avoid having anything like that. Um, late payments you've had in the last 12 to 24 months are going to be the most impactful to your credit score. Um, one other note, just on the credit slide here, account closures, um, you know, you really want to try to avoid when you do balance transfers and then maybe closing out the other account, um, because one of the, the weightings for the credit score is length of credit. So if you've had a very long standing credit, uh, credit account, and then you close that account out, it basically pulls out all the great history from the credit model and could lower your credit score. <clears throat> so you want to just be kind of careful with that. If you decide to do a balance transfer and, and close an account out. Now, in lending, we always look at the middle credit score for our clients. So um, what that looks like is if I have a 760 score as my highest score, and then it's 740 and 720, as a lender, we're going to use the middle credit score, which is the 740, to determine your qualifying. Now, if my spouse decides to apply with me, and my spouse has a 720, 700, and a 680 credit score, we're going to utilize a 700 credit score because we have to take the lowest middle score between both borrowers to determine qualifying. So we'd use a 700 score in that case. And like I said, every loan program does have a minimum credit score requirement. So we'll take that middle score, match it up to whatever the credit score requirement is. And that's how we'll determine some of the eligibility when it comes to designing financing. Here's a matrix that shows kind of how long negative items will impact your credit score. So like hard inquiries, 
Um, generally, they'll kind of have an impact to your score in the most recent two years, 12 to, 12, 12 to 24 months, I think is pretty fair. And then late payments in the last, uh, late payments will be on your credit report for seven years, but the most recent two years will impact you. And then things like bankruptcies, which are federal records, um, will be on there 10 years or less. Um, for qualifying guidelines, usually you have to be out of a bankruptcy at least two years for a, um, an FHA loan product and four years uh, for a conventional loan. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, student loans are something that come up quite a bit when it comes to designing home buying options for our clients. Um, and there's different ways we kind of look at the student loan uh, when it comes to like the qualifying of the payment. Now, all federal student loans, as we know, are in uh, forbearance right now because of the CARES Act, which came to us in 2020 as part of the pandemic. Um, so there's no payments required. And I do know there's forgiveness that that's trying to get pushed through uh, legislation right now. Um, and so many of you have probably been contacted about your federal student loans and eligibility for that, like, like some of our clients have been. That being said, until the forgiveness goes in place and those balances are reduced, we still have to use the existing balances that are out there. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we calculate payments. If you're on an income-based repayment amount and you were on one prior to the pandemic when your payment went to zero, that's the payment we'll use. And because that's generally the lowest option, um, because if we don't have an income-based repayment amount, then we have to either use 0.5% of the outstanding balance for an FHA loan or 1% of the balance for a conventional loan. So generally, the income-based repayment is going to be more favorable because it helps bring those monthly obligations down and improves what we call debt-to-income debt to income ratio, which you're going to learn a little bit more about in just a bit. Um, but that's kind of what the student loan rules look like for qualifying right now. If you are back in school and you're on a deferment, we still have to count a minimum payment against you for qualifying. So those, those payments will need to be counted into the, into the qualifying. And it's to ensure that, you know, as you purchase a home in the future, that when that debt becomes uh, something that you're obligated to pay that, you know, it's going to make sense for you and be affordable for you to cre basically create sustainable home ownership. Okay, now let's talk about the loan programs because there's a variety of different programs out there. You can Google different options, but these are kind of five of the core products that are usually offered for our home buyers. And conventional and FHA will be the primary sources for first time buyer programs. Um, so the conventional loan, which you'll probably hear Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, that's a minimum down payment of 3%. Um, and then FHA loans, that's a minimum down payment of 3.5%. And a lot of people think FHA loans are just for first-time buyers. They're actually for first-time, second-time buyers. doesn't have any designation. Um, and then VA loans is a 0% down payment uh, for our veterans that are, have eligibility. And then USDA loans are a no down payment. Those are going to be for rural areas like Placerville can, is actually considered rural. Winters, some of those areas around here. And then jumbo loans will be um, for our clients that are trying to purchase above the conforming loan limits. In fact, the conform conforming loan limits just went up, uh, just were announced today uh, for 2023. Um, I'll have Ken put those in the uh, in the chat for you guys so you can see those um, and, and a link to those. Those do those loan limits will vary by county. So there's what we call high cost of living counties like let's say San Francisco or San Jose or LA, Orange County. So there are higher limits, but Sacramento is actually designated a high, high cost area too as well. So um, there's new loan limits coming out for that as well. So we had 17, 715 in here because that's what we thought we were gonna land with conforming limits, um, but they actually came out a little bit higher based upon Fannie Mae's announcement here in the last couple of days. Um, why that's important to, to us as first time home buyers is because you can put up to 3% down all the way up to the conforming limit. But once you go beyond that conforming limit, it's a minimum down payment of 5%. Okay. Um, now I didn't talk about the characteristics of jumbo loans because that's pretty important because we, we do have it there, but that product is not usually your typically entry level first time buyer program because it does require 10 to 15% down for a first time buyer. Um, it's for clients that are buying beyond the conforming limit. And not only does it require a buyer to save up for the down payment and closing costs, but we also have to save up for a thing called uh, reserves. And it might not even be something you have to save up for. You may just have it in your retirement or your brokerage account. But what it is, reserves are generally 12, 6 to 12 months worth of your monthly payment that you have remaining in your asset accounts after you've contributed your down payment and closing costs. So let's say I have a payment of $6,000 on a mortgage and it has a 12-month reserve requirement. That means I have to have $72,000 set aside 
in addition to my down payment and my closing cost funds. Okay, so that's what a jumbo loan looks like. Um, as I mentioned earlier, conventional loans and FHA loans are going to be the typical loan programs that first-time buyers consider. Now, when you do put less than 20% down on a conventional loan, there's a thing called mortgage insurance. And um, mortgage insurance takes shape in a couple different ways um, and our payment option takes shape in a couple different ways. Um, you can pay mortgage insurance through a monthly mortgage insurance premium. You can do a split mortgage insurance premium where you pay a little bit upfront, some of it monthly. You can buy out the mortgage insurance entirely, which is called single premium mortgage insurance. And then there's lender paid mortgage insurance. And that's where a lender says, instead of getting a 6.1% rate, maybe I'll take a 6.75% rate. And then I'll utilize that rate increase to buy out my mortgage insurance entirely. Doesn't really happen very often, especially in today's market where interest rates are already high as it is. So affordability can be, be a bit of a challenge. More often than not, first time buyers or buyers in general are going to elect monthly mortgage insurance. And, and why you might want to do that is because in, in a future date, usually within two years, and once you have 22% equity in your home, you can apply to have mortgage insurance canceled. And so a lot of our first time buyers, especially the ones that purchased three or four years ago, were able to cancel their mortgage insurance without having to refinance their home. So that's pretty important. Um, there's different ways of, uh, or there's characteristics to calculating PMI. And so for those of you who do your maybe Zillow searches or Redfin searches and kind of doing some payment calculations on their websites, most of their mortgage insurance calculators don't have an accurate figure because they're not they don't they're not aggregated to what the real characteristics look like on a mortgage insurance premium because it's based upon your credit score, how much you put down, and then how much you finance. So the higher my credit score is, the more I put down. Actually, my mortgage insurance is going to be minimal. Um, you know, some of those calculators that you'll see on online have defaulted two hundred dollar payments on a mortgage insurance, but like I said, the higher credit score is, the more you put down, the less your mortgage insurance premium could be. Um, let me show you what a, a mortgage insurance uh, scenario could look like. So if we look at the bottom of this slide, and let's say I was financing $450,000 for a house, and I had a 740 credit score, and I was putting the minimum of 3% down, my mortgage insurance is going to be about $183 a month, um, which is pretty reasonable. Um, and you know, you do have options to kind of change how you want to structure your, your mortgage insurance, as we see here with the different payment options. But typically, it would be about $183 a month. Now, if I had a 680 credit score and instead of a 740 credit score, then that mortgage insurance premium would increase slightly. The other program that first time buyers will consider is FHA loans. FHA loans go down to as low as a 580 credit score. Mortgage insurance looks a little bit different when it comes to FHA loans. And that's why we kind of have this side-by-side -side comparison. Mortgage insurance is going to be in effect whether you put 20% down or not on an FHA loan. So the monthly mortgage insurance premium is always going to be 0.85% of the loan amount unless I put 10% down or more. And then it drops slightly to 0.80%. I'm also going to have upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of my loan amount. And unfortunately, with FHA loans, we cannot cancel mortgage insurance. We can only do it through a refinance. So even though my home's gone up by $100,000 in value, I only can cancel that mortgage insurance if I refinance into a new loan. So now if I look at the PMI calculation here, we're going to take the same loan amount of 450. And I, I'm going to add in the 0.85% plus I have that upfront mortgage insurance. So now my when I add the upfront mortgage insurance, that's going to increase my amount finance from 450 to 457, uh, 875. Um, and then I will have the monthly PMI of 324 and 32 cents per month. So when you look at those numbers and you kind of do your side by side calculation, clearly FHA mortgage insurance is much more expensive than conventional loans. And that's true. But the guidelines for FHA will look a little bit different than conventional. There's a little more leniency when it comes to qualifying with an FHA loan. As you've heard earlier, credit scores are a little bit lower, but some of the criteria around maybe a past bankruptcy will be less uh, stringent with FHA. It's two year requirement for a past bankruptcy, whereas conventional loan is four years. Um, you know, Late payments as you may have had in the last 12 to 24 months, FHA is probably gonna be okay with that. Conventional might be a little tougher to get qualified. Um, debt to income ratios, which you're going to learn about in just a bit, are a little easier on FHA. So while FHA may be a little bit more expensive, um, it's going to allow a little, add a little bit more flexibility for some of our first-time buyers that need that um, extra benefit. 
Okay, any questions on loan programs before we kind of uh, switch gears and go into um, different kind of documentation required for your financing? Okay, all right. And again, if you have questions pop up, feel free to just kind of throw, it out, throw them at me and we can, we can certainly discuss those during tonight's presentation. Um, let's talk about some of the documentation needed uh, as you prepare for home buying. So if I'm a W-2 wage earner, so let's say I'm working for the state, for example, um, we're generally going to ask for the last two years of W-2s and your last 30 days of pay stubs. Um, so it'll be one pay stub because the state usually gets paid once a month. And then a verification of employment that we'll actually complete uh, for you. Um, we don't do that at the pre-approval stage. That'll be done once we have an accepted offer on a house. Now, if I'm self-employed, we're gonna need a little bit more documentation. Usually we'll need the last two years of taxes. We'll need some type of profit and loss statement um, to show kind of the financial health of the business. And then we'll need to verify the business, either through like a business license, maybe a CPA letter, uh, something of that nature. Um, now, there's a couple misconceptions out there when it comes to qualifying income for a mortgage. We hear these quite often from our clients. Most people think that you need to have two years on your job in order to qualify for a mortgage, which actually isn't the case. What you need to do is either show two years of work history, or you can have a total of uh, work history and education. So I could be, let's say, <clears throat> one year on my job or even one month on my job as an accountant working for the state, but I graduated from Sac State with a four-year degree and I have my education that supports my, my career field, right? That would help satisfy the two-year requirement. And so we see that, especially with a lot of our young alumni that's recent, recently graduated and they're now they're starting to go into their, 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 um, their career. Um, they can still get qualified for a mortgage because they have that educational um, you know, years behind them and now they're going and working in their field of study. So that's an option for first time buyers uh, or buyers in general. Now, for those of our buyers that have maybe dual employment, um, you do have to show two years on the same job. So let's say, for example, I work at Sutter working 30 hours a week. And I also work at Kaiser working 20 hours a week. In order to use both sources of income, I do have to show that I've been working at both uh, employers for two years simultaneously in order to include that income. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're doing a job transition, so let's say uh, you're working for one employer right now, uh, but you have an offer letter to go work for another employer two months from now. Um, if that's an executed offer letter, we can actually qualify you on the offer letter as long as you're going to get your first paycheck before your first mortgage payment is due on your new house that you're buying. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to just kind of touch on here as it relates to income is for side employment. So let's say you're driving for Uber or DoorDash or whatever the case may be, in order to add that supplemental income as a W-2 wage earner or that income in general, you do have to show that you've been doing that, that employment, which is self-employment for at least two years. Okay, so let's kind of stick with income. Now we're going to look at income versus our obligations. So usually when it comes to calculating a thing called debt to income ratio, we're going to take your pre-tax income um, because that's the kind of calculation that's, that's used universally in lending. Now, I do realize that we don't take home what our gross pay is, so it's kind of a misused calculation. It doesn't necessarily indicate affordability. It's looking at more qualifying. So if I'm making $5,000 a month, um, that's my pre-tax. That's what we're going to base what we call debt-to-income ratio off. And debt-to-income ratio is taking our monthly obligations. We're taking our house payment, including the principal, interest, taxes, insurance, mortgage insurance, and then maybe credit card debts, um, personal loans, auto loans, student loans, any of that stuff gets all factored in. Any kind of offline payments you're making, let's say maybe daycare or dry cleaning expense or entertainment expense, whatever it might be, that, that isn't factored into the, into the debt to income ratio. It's more, uh, more often than just including items that show up on your credit report. Usually we don't want your debt to income ratio to exceed more than 45% of your pre-tax income. Now, as I mentioned, it's a qualifying metric. It's not an affordability metric. So when we sit down with you and do a one-on-one -on -one for your consultation, we're going to talk more about affordability, not necessarily qualifying, because it's more important for me to be able to design a sustainable home ownership plan for you than just see what you can qualify for. Okay. Um, here's what a debt to income ratio looks like. So we're going to take into consideration, like I said earlier, the principal interest, the taxes and the insurance of my new house. Um, PMI, if I put less than 20% down, uh, HOA expense, and that's going to really come into play if I'm buying maybe a townhouse 
a condo. Some of our single family residence communities will have HOAs. Let's say if my total payment was $2,500 a month to buy my house and I had $500 in debts, and then my gross monthly income was $8,500 a month. So if I take my $3,000 expenses divided by my $8,500 in income, my debt to income ratio is 35.29%. Okay, so that's how we factor that in as, as, a, as a lender. We'll go through the debt to income ratio calculation with you as part of a consultation. So you don't have to do it on your own. Certainly you can, if you wanna use this formula and kind of figure out what it looks like tonight after, after tonight's class, you can certainly do that. But we're gonna actually do that for you as part of your consultation. Most first time buyers are gonna feel pretty good around a 33 to 36% debt to income ratio. Um, again, we can go up to 45%. In some cases we can go to 49%. But we have to figure out, you know, what that looks like, right? Um, I met with some first-time buyers earlier today, and they felt more comfortable at 26% debt to income ratio. So everybody's personal situation is a little bit different, you know, and, and how much disposable income they want to have after contributing um, to those expenses, right? Um, now, the last component to purchasing a home is really the saving side of it, right? How, what my assets look like. That's probably one of the biggest struggles for first time buyers next to, you know, just maybe credit challenges that we've had in the past or just maybe being overextended with credit. And so, you know, those two things, assets, credit um, can be kind of the two major hurdles for first time home buyers entering the market. Um, we're going to talk about some solutions around assets like we have around credit, but I want to kind of share with you what some of the typical pieces of documentation we'll need. Um, and then we'll kind of get into some solutions uh, for first time buyers. Um, the first thing we want to look at is just, just your typical documentation. Um, you know, if you're saving money in your checking and savings account, um, we'll generally ask for the last two months of statements for those accounts. Um, if you've had any cash deposits, unfortunately, we can't utilize those accounts. Um, if there's any large deposits, we also wouldn't be able to use those accounts. Um, but generally, it's the last 60 days worth of savings or, or checking account, right? Um, and then retirement accounts uh, can also be used, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs. If you're going to access 403bs or I should say IRA accounts, you just want to check with your financial advisor, maybe your tax planner, just to make sure it's not going to create, create any type of financial or sorry tax liability for you in accessing those funds. And then gift funds can be also be eligible. Um, so if you have a family member that's willing to help out with your down payment or maybe your closing costs, um, that can be allowed in financing in addition to whatever funds you're going to utilize. Most first-time buyer programs will also allow gift funds too. So you can get help with some of your down payment and closing costs, but also be able to supplement with gift funds from a family member. And usually the documentation is going to include a gift letter, uh, the, the transfer of the funds showing the proof that that money has moved either to you or to what we call the escrow. Um, which is basically kind of holding all the funds to a home purchase transaction. Um, and we will kind of walk you through what documentation looks like if kind of gift funds is something that you're looking, looking for in your home buying plan. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, you know, savings and just kind of accruing enough assets to purchase a home is probably one of the biggest challenges for first time buyers. And I'm really excited that we get a chance to partner with Cal HFA, which is the California Housing Finance Agency. Um, and this organization is designed to help create sustainable home ownership in, um, in California. And uh, it services both our low income uh, uh, clients in the community as well as our moderate income clients in the community. And we've had some recent changes with Cal HFA. Um, for those of you that may be kind of checking out what Cal HFA options are out there, um, just yesterday, uh, we, we just finished off the funding of the Forgivable Equity Builder Program. That was a huge success. Um, that launched uh, five months ago, and we already utilized all the funds, um, you know, within within five months. It really went pretty quick, and that was a huge success. We helped out hundreds of buyers with that program. That allowed buyers to get up to 10% of their purchase price in forgivable assistance. It was basically like a grant. Um, there's not plans to replenish those funds, and so we we have a we have other products available right now, and then we have one forthcoming, which I'm going to share with you in just a minute. Um, the program that we have available right now for first-time buyers is called the My Home Assistance Program. That provides up to 3% of your sales price and assistance um, for a conventional loan, 3.5% for your FHA loan. So if we kind of think back to the program highlights that we talked about earlier this evening, you have those minimum down payments. The My Home Assistance would satisfy the minimum down payment. So the only thing we would have to worry about as a first-time buyer is closing costs. Um, so that's a really cool option for us as well. 
it's not forgivable um, as assistance goes, but we would have to repay that assistance when we either sold the home or if we refinance in the future. And I'll, I'll share with you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Now, the product that we have under construction right now, and we're targeting a launch date of early Q1 of 2023. So we're hoping uh, as early as possible in Q1 because we've had a lot of like demand for this program. It's called the California Dream for All program. And I'm lucky enough to be on the project team for this, this program. And like I said, we're hoping we can release this in early 2023. We're just waiting for the state to kind of go through a few details. But what it's going to look like is you can get up to 20% of your sales price in assistance, which is huge. And you think about our lessons around mortgage insurance, right? You put 20% down, no mortgage insurance. So now I have a lesser payment, um, no mortgage insurance, and I'm financing less too. Now, this program is not going to be forgivable. So the 20% will have to be repaid once you either sold the home or if you refinance in the future. But the, the next component is something that's it's going to be a first time uh, or it, it's kind of it's something that we haven't done in the state before, which is called an equity share agreement. And what that equity share agreement says is that, you know, when you sell the home or if you refinance in the future, you'll pay back the 20 percent that you got for the assistance. But then the state would share in your equity growth 20 percent. Um, and so what we've again, we're under construction with the program, but what we what we think it's going to look like is. Let's say I buy my house today and seven years from now I sell and I've accrued $100,000 in appreciation. 20% of that or $20,000 would be given back to the state. So you would have $80,000 remaining for you. Plus, and then of course the 20% would be paid back to the state. Um, so there is some trade-offs there, but the end of the day to be able to access home ownership, um, whether you're a low income buyer or a moderate income buyer is going to be a huge opportunity and really is going to hopefully change many of our communities and the ability to be able to tap into home ownership for our communities. Um, the income limits on Cal HFA are, are quite higher than most first time buyer programs. So in Sacramento, the limits are now $202,000. You can see all of our surrounding counties. So when we think about moderate income, um, that income level is, is, is pretty significant. And, and honestly, it's not very far off of where the Bay Area limits are today. Um, now let's talk about a little bit more detail around the My Home Assistance Program if that's of interest to you. So again, it's 3% of your sales price, 3.5% on an FHA loan. Um, it is a low interest loan that you would pay back to the state upon sell or refinance, but it's at 1% interest and it's simple interest. Okay. Um, and it's deferred payment. So if you decide you want to pay it back early before you sold the refinance, you can absolutely do that as well. Um, I got your question, Christine, on Monterey County. So we'll pull that up for you. Um, uh, Ken might be able to jump onto the Cal HFA website. And we can also uh, share with you the, the link to the Cal HFA income limits too. So you can check that out. Um, Monterey County will be uh, a bit higher than, than Sacramento, but we'll put that link in the, in the chat for you guys. Um, now there's another program available for closing cost assistance, which is called the ZIP assistance. Um, that program is starting to come back now because interest rates are starting to trying to start to lower uh, or decrease quite a bit. So that program was offline for the last four weeks, but we're starting to see it come back. And what that does is it provides up to 2% of your loan amount in interest free assistance. Um, so you can take, you can have the down payment assistance and then you can add on the zip assistance to get two to 3% of your loan amount. Now you can't jump straight to the zip assistance. You have to first take the, my home assistance. And then once you've utilized those funds and you need additional support, then we can add on the zip assistance. Okay. And the zip again stands for zero interest program. Okay. So those programs are kind of the constant for Cal HFA. We've had those for years. These new programs like the Forgivable Equity Builder Program that just discontinued and then the California Dream product will be additions on top of the My Home and the Zip Assistance programs um, that are currently available. Let me show you a quick example of what this would look like if we utilize the My Home and Zip Assistance program. So let's say we bought a $450,000 house. We now know that the minimum down payment is 3%. So that would be $13,500. And then we also have closing costs that are generally two to three percent of your uh, of your sales price, and um, and so if those are nine thousand to say thirteen thousand five hundred, we're probably going to need about twenty two five hundred to twenty seven thousand dollars out of pocket. So for some of us, that's a that's a big reach. It's going to be really tough to to obtain that, but 
if we were able to kind of utilize these Cal HFA assistance programs, um, we could get that 3% my home to help offset our down payment. And then we would have the option to either pay for our closing costs out of pocket, or we could bolt on that zip assistance, as you can see here, to add two to 3% of my loan amount to then create anywhere between 23 to $28,000 in eligible assistance that I can use towards my cash out of pocket. So a really great opportunity there through the conventional loan. The same math applies to the, the FHA loan. And in fact, we have a, an example for you here that you can see. So the same logic applies. So we have the 3.5% down payment. We can use the 3.5% My Home to offset that. And then we have the, the closing cost assistance as well, too. Um, we had a question that came in through the chat, which was, um, you know, what's the income limits for the My Home Assistance? So those are the income limits that we shared in the previous slide. So those are the moderate income limits. There is low income limits too available through Cal HFA, and we have special incentives for low income housing. So that basically means if you make less than 80% of the median income, which in Sacramento County is, is like 81,000, the interest rate has a differential of 0.125%. So Today, the interest rate offering for a low-income housing buyer on a 30-year fixed conventional loan was 6% versus 6.125% for a moderate income uh, buyer. The state of California sets all the interest rates for the program. Um, these program rates will change every day based upon the market conditions. And once we are further down the road in home ownership and we have an accepted offer, that's when we can register you for these programs and lock in your interest rate. So hopefully that answers your question around kind of the my home income limits. Um, here's the eligibility requirements. It's a minimum credit score of 640 for an FHA loan, 680 for a conventional loan. Now, if I'm considered low income housing, I make around that $81,000 mark, then the minimum credit score is 660. Uh, the debt to income ratio can go as high as 50% for our clients that are above a 700 credit score, but the standard baseline debt to income ratio is 45%. One of the unique things about Cal HFA is most programs will look at the total household size. This just looks at the applicant, um, applicant, applicant income. And why that's really important is because in some cases, if we have dual income earner households and I'm making, let's say, $100,000 a year and my spouse makes $100,000, potentially maybe my, our income combined takes us over the income limit. With Cal HFA, only one person can apply and, and keep yourselves below the income limits to help you with the eligibility for the first time buyer program. So that's a kind of a nice little uh, attribute of, of what the assistance programs look like. Um, and a first time home buyer is not someone that's never ever owned. It's actually someone that hasn't owned in the last three years as their primary residence. In fact, we had a couple of clients today that have had rental properties, um, but they're still eligible for the first time buyer program as long as they haven't had ownership as their primary residence in the last three years. And these programs are for um, clients that are purchasing single family homes, new construction, condos, townhouses, even what we call as below market homes uh, can all be eligible for Cal HFA. Manufactured homes get a little bit tricky because manufactured homes have to be on land that is owned. Uh, it can't be like in a park or anything like that. It has to be on, you know, acreage, so to speak, um, that um, can basically deem it as real property. All right, so that's a little bit about some of the first time home buyer programs. I, I, I really truly think it's a huge opportunity for first time buyers um, to make home ownership a, a, a reality for you. And we have hundreds of success stories of first time buyers that we've helped that many, many families thought they were like three, four, five years away from home ownership and utilizing the Cal HFA support and resources were able to make home ownership a near term goal. So, really, really proud of that. Um, so, let's talk about the path towards home ownership and the six steps of home buying. So. We've created this visual tool here for you to kind of see what the path towards homeownership looks like. The first step is going to be pre-approval, and that's where you meet with us for a consultation. You'll be meeting with me one-on-one -on -one to design some home buying options for you. Look at interest rates, different payment scenarios, out-of-pocket expenses, basically design a, a home buying comprehensive plan for you. And the output of that, that consultation is to have you pre-approved to show that you're basically eligible for financing. And it creates a certificate that we'll send to you in a PDF file, and you can utilize that to make offers on properties. Now, before you start making offers on properties, you'll start with your house hunting, which is step two. And that's where you get, you'll probably start with an online search. And then 
we would recommend connecting with a realtor. Um, if you need help in finding the right realtor, we have a list of preferred realtors that we work with across the state. Um, but you know, as I mentioned earlier, realtors are paid for by the seller. So we encourage you to really take advantage of that resource. So we, we feel like that's a great opportunity to have more, more support for you, not only to find the right house, but to help with negotiating. Now, as you go out and look at homes and let's say you find a house that's maybe $10,000 cheaper than your pre-approval letter, we can always uh, update your pre-approval uh, to match your offer price of that home. Now, let's say you make an offer to a seller, the seller accepts that offer. Now we're gonna move to step three and that's called entering escrow. So that means I have an agreement with the seller to purchase a home for a certain price. And there's gonna be some timelines that are attached to that agreement of, Kind of things that we're going to have to make sure milestones that we're hitting in the process and at step three we're going to meet with you for what we call a follow-up consultation and that's where we meet with our clients over video to talk about you know the details of your accepted contract what your financing looks like interest rate and that includes the interest rate options your out-of-pocket expense maybe some assistance programs that you're looking at um, just to make sure you have a clear picture there's the kind of really key things that are important to our buyers obviously your interest rate your payment and of course your out-of-pocket expense so we'll get that all sorted out during that consultation now usually within a contract you're going to have to make what we call an earnest money deposit and that is usually one to three percent of your purchase price now those funds count towards your um, out-of-pocket expense it usually has to be deposited to the escrow company within two to three days of your accepted offer. Um, now, as we begin step three, we're gonna order an appraisal of your house and that's to ensure that your house is worth what you're paying it for. Um, one of the kind of the nice things in today's market because we have seen price reductions, a lot of the data that's coming in on appraisals is showing homes valuing out higher than what their, a lot of buyers are buying them for. So that's really encouraging sign. Um, you're also going to have inspections ordered and your realtor will usually help facilitate those. And then usually within 72 hours of step three, we're going to send what we call initial disclosures to you that highlights all of your interest rate, your payment, and your out-of-pocket expense that we've reviewed during your follow-up consultation. Now, you heard me mention a little bit about earnest money deposit, and that's a good faith deposit that you provide as a buyer to the escrow company. And it shows basically the seller that you have an interest in this property and a financial interest. Now, that deposit is protected, so the seller doesn't get access to that deposit at all because you have a thing called contingencies that help uh, protect that deposit. The contingencies usually are for your appraisal because we want to make sure your appraisal is, is supporting your, your purchase price of your home. It's for the inspection of the house to make sure there's no issues with the house. So, you know, if there's $10,000 in dry rot, it's something that could be something that, that could, you know, um, deter you from purchasing. We want to make sure that you understand what that looks like first. And then, of course, getting your loan approved, which is the loan contingency. Usually those contingency periods will be in the first 14 to 17 days of this contract period that starts here at step three. So that's usually like day one of the contract. Most escrow time periods are gonna be anywhere between 25 to 30 days. In today's market right now, in fact, I was talking to a realtor earlier today, You know, they wanna do a 21 day close, which is completely doable. Um, a lot of sellers wanna sell their homes before the end of the year, it could be because of tax purposes or whatever the case may be. So if you're looking at, purchasing soon, you, you know, that's something you're probably going to see a little bit in the market. Um, as we move from step three to step four, there's processing and underwriting. That's where we're doing the administrative task of the loan. We're verifying your employment, like I talked a little bit about earlier, verifying your assets. Uh, we're going to have your rate locked in for your product before that period of time. We actually do that usually at step three. Um, but what we're doing there at step four is preparing everything to go to the underwriting team. And the underwriting team will, they're kind of like the QC side of the business where they're doing all the quality control to make sure that, you know, all the details of your application meet the requirements of the loan. Um, and they'll issue a loan approval at step five. And that's really getting us to about three quarters of the way through the process. So we're kind of on the home stretch by that time. Um, on the compliance side of things, we're going to issue to you a final closing disclosure in step five, which gives you a three day cooling off period to make sure just the terms of your loan are you know, satisfactory and everything that you expected. There should be no surprises on the numbers of, of how your financing is structured by the time we get to step five. Everything is very transparent. So any changes that happen in your loan, we want to make sure that we bring those to you right away. Um, so the last milestone is step six. That's the closing of the loan. Um, you're going to be signing final documents. Those are done in person with the public notary. 
everything up before step six is all done usually via e-signature um, and it's all pretty pretty easy to, to and pretty turnkey for you but step six we do have to meet with the public notary there usually is a fee for that as part of your closing costs that process takes about an hour to maybe an hour and a half depending on the, the how the financing is structured after you complete that meeting you'll be wiring in the funds that are remaining for your closing of your home that money gets reconciled by the escrow team um, so they make sure that your money has been accounted for, your deposit, your final cash out of pocket, and then we wire in the funds for the mortgage. All those funds get reconciled to ensure you're contributing what you're supposed to as a buyer, and the seller's obviously getting the sales proceeds they, that they expected. Once everything is accounted for and balanced, then documents get released out to the county recorder's office. So if you're buying in Sacramento County, the recorder's office is like a block away from our office. Um, they'll record documents for a grant deed and that transfers ownership to you. And they also record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. So once all that gets confirmed, then you become the official owner of the, of the home, okay? So that's what, that's what the buying process looks like and, um, you know, you know, this is something that will be staying and connected with you as you move through the process. So it's not like you go out and find a home and get it in an escrow and have an accepted offer. We're going to stay connected with you through our team and some of our mobile features throughout the process. So you always get real time updates. Um, now, if you're looking to kind of build a home buying plan and want to get connected with us for a consultation, uh, that's a free service we provide. Here are some of the steps to begin that uh, right here on this on this slide. So you can uh, fill out a really simple online application. You can upload documents. Like I said, we do do a soft credit score, but that doesn't impact your score at all. And then we meet up with you for a video call um, just to help design a plan. And you know whether you're going to buy next year or maybe two or three years out, at least that consultation will give you that roadmap to achieve home ownership. Now, if you have some questions after tonight's discussion and you got, kind of want to go over maybe a, per, um, a, a financial situation that you know maybe it's credit related or maybe questions around savings or employment, really encourage you to set up an intro call with us. Um, we can kind of go through those details. And then when you're ready, you can take those next steps for a full consultation. Here's the kind of the framework of a consultation. So I've, I've kind of mentioned a few times tonight, but it's about, you know, location of, of where we want to buy, because that's going to be, you know, driving some of our prices. We're going to look at affordability. We're going to look at interest rates, closing costs, our debt to income ratio, credit, um, review those six steps of home buying again. And then, you know, if everything looks good for us and, and it feels feels like a good, good fit for you with the plan that we've designed, then we're going to go ahead and issue that pre-approval letter for you. And we got some fantastic resources, which includes our mobile app. I uh, really encourage you to download that, available for Apple and, and uh, Android. Uh, this will not only allow you to apply for your applic uh, apply um, for your financing, but it'll push real-time updates for you um, throughout the process. Our, our clients just love it. Uh, it's very interactive. You can actually send us messages through the mobile app and we can respond uh, quickly with any questions you have. So a lot of great tools available out there for you. And there's also a calculator function within the mobile app that I think is really helpful for our buyers as you're out looking at homes. Um, you probably heard about Science Workshop because of our fantastic partnership with Sac State. I, I'm so thrilled to be in partnership with Sac State. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a true joy to get a chance to, to present this content to our local community. Um, we've been in partnership with Sac State for the last, I think, about three months um, and really excited. We've helped uh, several buyers already buy their first homes um, through our partnership. So um, really, really feel grateful to be able to do that. And with our Sac State Alumni and Athletic Partnership, um, you get a $750 discount in your closing costs. Um, with with our team. So that's something that we'll kind of share with you during a consultation. All of, like I said earlier, all of our consultations are free. So when we build these home buying plans, it's something we want to invest in our communities to help educate you on what your financial futures could look like with home ownership. And so uh, we want to make sure those you have free access to that. Um, and like I said, this is probably one of the biggest investments you're going to make in your lifetime. So or in your financial futures, at least. Um, and so, you know, taking time out tonight to be able to learn a little bit more about this, um, hopefully is, has been really super beneficial for you. Now, we have other partnerships across uh, the state, too. So, you know, if you have, like I said, friends or family or coworkers that also would like to see these workshops, um, they're more than welcome to join us at some of our upcoming classes. Okay. Um, 
And uh, let me just let me just get us to the. I got a I got a couple slides that came in, or um, sorry, a couple more slides left, and just one question I'll answer, and then we'll kind of get wrapped up. Here's all my personal contact information. So if you do have any questions, you want to reach out to me, give me a call. You can message me. Um, like I said, you can we can schedule an intro call um, for a convenient time that works best for you. Uh, really encourage you to kind of check out some of the reviews we have from some of our clients, a lot of which are graduates from these classes that we've uh, held over the last six seven years. Um, a lot of great things clients are saying about us online. And we, we do a lot of kind of educational posting on Instagram. So we really encourage you to follow us there, um, especially with some of the announcements coming out with other first time buyer programs in the new year. So we're trying to be kind of diligent with posting some of the updates or any of the, any of the things that we hear about um, that are available. So um, you can follow us at J Made a Mortgage on Instagram. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, we'll have our class schedule posted for upcoming classes in the new year, and that can be found at mortgageeducate.com. Okay. I had a couple of questions that came in. I want to answer these before we uh, uh, get wrapped up here. Uh, let me just read this really quick. So question was, um, you know, I guess one of our guests actually met with a loan officer today and, and want to get maybe a second opinion. Would that affect my credit score? Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we meet with our clients, we don't start with a hard inquiry. It's just a soft inquiry. So that won't impact your score. So yeah, I, I'd encourage you to, you know, if you'd like us to give you a second opinion, uh, we'll go ahead and go through a consultation process like we talked about, but it would only be a soft credit score. So it won't impact your, your credit at all. So we're basically at the end of tonight's session, um, a little bit over time, so I apologize for that, but I do want to leave it open for any questions that, that the uh, audience has uh, before we uh, end tonight's session. Okay, well, I think... I think we're good. Of course, if you do have any questions you want to reach out to me directly, please do. Um, I know it's a it's a, a wet, dreary night in the Sacramento area, but I hope uh, you guys are safe at home tonight. And um, you know, those of you that are going to be out at the, uh, the football game on Saturday, hopefully we can get a chance to see you there. Come up and uh, say hi. Um, and then last question just came out just really quick before I sign us off. Um, how will you announce the California Dream product? Um, so the California Dream product will be announced on our social channels. We're going to send it out through our email distribution. Um, we're excited to announce the California Dream product. And I, as I get more information on that, um, I'll definitely be posting on our social channels um, as I kind of work with the project team at CaliHFA. All right. All right. Um, good seeing everybody this evening. Uh, stingers up. Have a great, uh, great weekend. And hopefully we get a win on Saturday.